Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of House Arconan, Prelude to June, book number two by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. Cat just jumped up behind you, but it's okay, I don't think you can tell. Um, I am only about 60, 70 pages into this bad boy. Um, I'm actually going to visit my mum in the Midlands tomorrow. So um, my goal is basically bring you up to date with where I am with this before I leave, and then hopefully finish off either while I'm there or when I get back, I will do uh, the rest of the review. So, blurby blurb, um, it's a long old one. Dane reads. Duke Leto Atreides is now the skillful and much-loved ruler of Caladan, where two of his most loyal warriors have come to manhood. Duncan Idaho trains to become House Atreides' new swordmaster, and Gurney Halleck, tortured slave of the Harkonnens, begins the ordeal of loss and pain that will eventually bring him to Duke Leto's side. Leto's heart is at war with his duty, for he must marry for politics and power, not love. Despite the charms of Princess Kalia of the fallen House of Ix and Jessica, the exquisite, perfectly trained concubine chosen by the Bene Gesserit to be the mother of Leto's daughter. At House Harkonnen, archenemy of House Atreides, Baron Vladimir is slowly being consumed by a loathsome disease. His nephew and heir, Raban, prepares to take over the Harkonnen Empire. At the same time, gentle, helpless Avulard strives to undo his half-brother's cruelty and his own son's viciousness. On June, planet Arrakis, House Arconum ruthlessly harvests the precious mind-enhancing spice melange. Planetologist Pardo Kine's 12-year-old son Liet is already a Fremen warrior, learning firsthand of the savage injustices the Harkonnens inflict on his desert people and planning for the day the Fremen will defeat them. Once again, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson have built on the notes, outlines and correspondence Frank Herbert left behind at his death, as well as conversations and brainstorming sessions Brian Herbert held with his father to create an enthralling epic. This is a fitting prelude to June, the Hugo and Nebula award-winning novel, which is the best-selling science fiction novel of all time, with nearly 10 million copies in print. So, tabby tab tabs. Oh, it's got some maps and stuff. I'm not, not really one for maps, to be honest, but I know some people do. And I love the way this opens, because um, each chapter heading has like a little quote to it, um, and that's something that the other June books have as well. And the opening quote here is, uh, Discovery is dangerous, but so is life. A man unwilling to take risks is doomed never to learn, never to grow, never to live. And that's planetologist Pardo Kynes in An Arrakis Primer, written for his son, Liet. And Kynes was probably my favourite character of the last book as well. Although Leto is up there as well. And um, Liet kind of saves his dad because he turns this machine on. And um, his son, baby, well, this is what happens. Liet grabbed his father by the shoulder and pulled him from the controls. He slammed his hands down on the emergency cutoff switch and the suspense has faded. Confused, Kynes tried to protest, but his son urged him toward the open hatch. Get out now, run as fast as you can toward the rocks. But Liet's nostrils flared in angry exasperation. Suspensors operate on a Holtzman field, just like the shields. You know what happens when you activate a personal shield out in the open sand? And... Um, Basically what happens is a worm comes, which is why they're unable to use shields out in the open sand. Uh, we also get later on in this, we get some baby worms of like two meters long, I think they are. And Gurney Halleck's, um, he's got a, his most prized possession, an old ballast set, designed as a nine stringed instrument, though Gurney had learned to play with only seven, since two strings were broken and he had no replacements. Um, but then it says this as well, he had found the discarded instrument damaged and useless, but after working on it patiently for six months, sanding, lacquering, shaping parts, the ballast set made the sweetest music he'd ever heard, albeit without a full tonal range. Gurney spent hours in the night strumming the strings, spinning the counterbalance wheel. He taught himself to play tunes he had heard, or compose new ones. But I kind of feel as though if he's going to do that kind of level of dedication, he should just make some new strings, because strings used to be made from... I think what was called cat gut. I don't know if it was actually the guts of cats. Don't listen, Biggie. Don't listen. No, it's not real. Uh, my cat is over there, just giving me the look. Um, but yeah, you could make your own strings if you needed to, especially if you had the expertise to repair the rest of the instrument. Granted, it wouldn't be very vegan. Okay, and another great quote here from Pardo Kynes from the Arrakis Lectures. Nature commits no errors. Right and wrong are human categories. Very true, I agree with that. So I think uh, I think it was actually in the previous book now, but there was a bit in that where um, a worm was hunted and it dissolved. And yet Chris knives are made from worms' teeth, the sandworms, and I was very confused by that. But it says here, um, uh, Once, early in his assignment on Arrakis, Keel had joined Rabin on an abortive worm hunt. They had taken a Fremen guide, well-armed troops, even a planetologist. 
Using the Fremen guide as bait, they had lured one of the enormous sandworms and killed it with explosives. But before Rabin could take his trophy, the beast had dissolved, sloughing into amoeba creatures that fell to the sand, leaving nothing but a cartilaginous skeleton and loose crystal teeth. So the teeth do stay behind. You may have just noticed my cat jump up behind you. He's gone to sit in the window and look outside. And we get this uh, thing where basically um, some um, Harkonnen troops poison the well of uh, a Fremen village using the blood, I think it was the blood, of a you know infant sandworm. And this is what happens. They poison the well, people drink from it, and we get this. In the centre of the village, they encountered a festival of horrors. The surviving victims wandered about as if insane, shrieking and snarling like animals. The noise was horrific, as was the smell. They had ripped hair out of their heads in bloody clumps. Some used long fingernails to claw the eyes out of their faces, then held the scooped eyeballs in their palms. Blind, they staggered against the tan walls of dwelling, leaving wet crimson smears. By Shai Halud, Liat whispered under his breath, while his father let out a louder curse in common imperial Gallic. One man with torn eye sockets like bloody extra mouths above his cheekbones collided with a crawling woman. Both victims flew into a rage and ripped at each other's skin with bare hands, biting and spitting and screaming. There were muddy spots on the street, overturned containers of water. And um, I just thought that was really like nicely written. It actually reminded me of James Herbert at times, um, the way that he can write these like really gore filled sort of visceral scenes. Quote, a great quote from the Orange Catholic Bible here, some lies are easier to believe than the truth. And I think that's particularly interesting when you consider the source of that quote. Uh, we get a reference to the myth of Sisyphus, which I've recently read the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. Uh, basically the idea of the myth of Sisyphus is that he was cursed to constantly roll a boulder uphill and then it would roll back down each day and he'd have to roll it back up again. Um, and this is because Duncan Idaho has been sent to become a sword master and um, the early parts of the training there are like very repetitive. He's basically being put into like a prison camp and um, he's wondering whether there's any point to it or not. Don't you bite my tabs. I need those to know what pages we're on. Here, let me get one out and you can... Okay, you're gone. A uh, great quote uh, that Stilgar shares. He says, It is said that when one waits for vengeance, time passes slowly but sweetly. And uh, one of the credos of the Bene Gesserit sisterhood here, it says... Religion is the emasculation of the adult by the child. Religion is the insistment of past beliefs. Mythology, which is guesswork. The hidden assumptions of trust in the universe. Those pronouncements which men have made in search of personal power. All mingled with shreds of enlightenment. And always the ultimate unspoken commandment is, Thou shalt not question. But we do anyway. We break that commandment as a matter of course. The work to which we have set ourselves is the liberating of the imagination. The harnessing of imagination to humankind's deepest sense of creativity. I just thought, again, that's really well written, but it's also one of those, like, that almost could have been from the myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus, you know? It's like, very philosophical. Uh, we get a line about the, the Tlelaxu, I can't pronounce it, um, but it says, They grew vegetables and roots by splitting cells so that the plants produced only shapeless tumours of edible material. Eating became a process rather than a pleasurable activity, as much a chore as the routine tasks during a shift. And I've kind of experienced that. I have a very strange relationship with food. Sometimes I love eating, sometimes not so much, and it does feel like a chore. Um, and actually, an idea that I thought was fascinating, um, my dad used to say that he wished there was a pill he could take instead of eating, so he'd just eat, take the pill and he wouldn't have to eat. Um, and he has uh, like some food intolerances, and I have irritable uh, bowel syndrome, so um, maybe it is. It's just a thing if you have problems with your digestive system eating just becomes a chore it's something you don't look forward to like for me i don't look forward to eating because i know i'll inevitably get a stomach ache and then moheim of the uh, bene Gesserit, she's um she's speaking to the baron vladimir harkonnen he's actually gone to try and intimidate the bene Gesserit, and they've kind of made themselves invisible so they're all in a room looking at the baron and his men but the baron like they can't see that the witches are there and um she uh, goes next to him and whispers to him uh, a, a barely discernible susurration that twisted words from the litany against fear into something altogether different. You shall fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. You cannot face your fear. It will pass inside you and infect you. When we look upon the path of your fear, there will be nothing left of you. Only the sisterhood will remain. And I just thought that was cool because I love the idea of the fear litany. I actually have it tattooed on my arm here or the opening line of it. So, uh, yeah, very cool. A great quote here from the philosophy of the Swordmaster, Friedrich Guinness. He says, 
To learn about this universe, one must embark on a course of discovery where real dangers exist. Education cannot impart this discovery. It is not a thing to be taught and used or put away. It has no goals. In our universe, we consider goals to be end products, and they are deadly if one becomes fixated on them. And a quote here from Cade Monerb, uh, Politics and Reality, and this is very true for today, especially when you think about the post-truth era and uh, the problems we have with fake news, even though I hate that term. Never underestimate the power of the human mind to believe what it wants to believe, no matter the conflicting evidence. Uh, another, again, and again, this is actually from something called the Philosophical Register of the Gil Booker Annals, and um, as I say, a, a lot of these just lines in this are very philosophical, which is kind of what interests me. So it says, the universe operates on a basic principle of economics. Everything has its cost. We pay to create our future. We pay for the mistakes of the past. We pay for every change we make. And we pay just as dearly if we refuse to change. And a quote from Prince Rombo Avernius, who's one of the major characters in this. Um, his house had kind of become renegades, and so Rombo and his sister are both sought refuge with the Atreides. Is. Uh, so Rombo says, to know what one ought to do is not enough. And again, another quote here that very much made me think of um, the post-truth world we live in. Uh, this is from Crown Prince Raphael Carino, who is the emperor, basically. Uh, the rudiments of power. Facts mean nothing when they are preempted by appearances. Do not underestimate the power of impression over reality. And again, it's very true. We just we take things very much based on their appearance, take them at face value. And um, this is a chapter about Gurney Halleck, who um, he's kind of living under Harkonnen rule and they're like dominating the villagers and whatnot. They've actually taken his sister away and basically turned her into a prostitute. Um, and then there's a quote from Duke Paulus Atreides, who is Leto Atreides' father, Paul Atreides' grandfather. Um, and it's a very fitting quote for what's actually going on in the storyline, but also it's a nice bit of foreshadowing, because Gurney then goes on to, um, to join the Atreides. If you surrender, you have already lost. If you refuse to give up, though, no matter the odds against you, at least you have succeeded in trying. And uh, Dominic Vernius, who is the father of the, the house that's gone into exile, uh, he's in, in, in exile himself. He's kind of working as a smuggler and trying to sabotage um, uh, the Emperor. But um, he ends up on June and he meets some Fremen and we get this kind of situation in which he spits on the ground to indicate his disdain for the Emperor. And the Fremen are like, oh, that's very different because we spit to show respect because to them water is sacred, you know? And um, Jessica goes through the task uh, that Paul goes through in June where he has to put his hand in the box. So. Um, she puts her hand in the box. Uh, there's a choice between three things. Um, does it say what they are? I'm just trying to remember what they are on the top of my head. Oh yeah, so it's uh, the blah blah blah, Gomja Bar. Um, okay, so there is pain. Yeah, pain of there's pain, pleasure, and eternity. And Jessica realizes that it's the pain of birth, the pleasure of a life well lived, and the eternity of death. So that's the order you go through them. Um, but as she's about to do this, uh, Moheim, Moheim of the, um, the Bene Gesserit, she says, People are not always humans. Ages ago, during the Butlerian Jihad, most people were merely organic automatons, following the commands of thinking machines. Beaten down, they never questioned, never resisted, never thought. They were people, but had lost the spark that made them human. And again, that's kind of one of the dangers that could happen to us in our society, especially if we over-rely on AI and algorithms. Uh, we also get um, Abulard Harkonnen and his wife, and um, they're the, the parents of Fade, who I believe is the one who was played by Sting in the original uh, David Lynch movie. Um, and we kind of get to see all the backstory of that, but I liked their inclusion because they're like good Harkonnens, they're not bad people, you know? Um, so that was nice, because it's always boring a bit when you get like just a caricature of evil or whatever, you know? So it's nice that there's an indication that there are actually some members of this family that aren't all bad. Uh, Dominic Vernius from his ECAS memoirs, again he's the guy who's uh, in exile. It is possible to become intoxicated with rebellion for rebellion's sake. Which sort of happens to him, I suppose. I mean, he wants vengeance um, for his... Well, obviously, his, his house has been totally destroyed, uh, and it's kind of the Emperor's fault. Uh, his wife's dead. His wife also used to be one of the Emperor's, older Emperor's concubines, um, but he then dies. But the younger Emperor is sort of s still his enemy, you know? This is one of the good things about the Dune books, is that they're all this, like, built upon, um, like, rivalries and hatreds and uh, alliances and all of this stuff. It is very much Game of Thrones in space, even though, obviously, this came first. Well, actually, Game of Thrones came before 
uh, this particular book, but the June series came first. A quote from Duke Leto Atreides, he says, What is each man but a memory for those who follow? Yep, very true. And a, a Zen Sunny Wisdom from the Wandering quote here, A man may fight the greatest enemy, take the longest journey, survive the most grievous wound, and still be helpless in the hands of the woman he loves. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, Gurney eventually finds his sister, Beth, whose name is spelled weird, it's B-H-E-T-H. -E um, and he sees she's got a white scar on her throat and they've, they've taken away her ability to sing or talk and to smile as well. Uh, they've basically just taken out her voice box. And uh, Raban, Raban Harkonnen, he says, your sister knows her place. In fact, she served us rather well. I checked through the records to come up with an exact number. This little girl has provided pleasure to 4,620 of our troops. Um, and then just the worst thing as well, because um, Gurney's kind of been captured and he's paralysed, so all he can do is watch, he can't even close his eyes, look away, and Raven kills his sister in front of him, and then just leaves her body there, and he just leaves, uh, he says, leave her body here, how long will her brother's paralysis last? The doctor approached quickly, unmoved by what he had just seen, another hour or two at that small dosage, any more of the Kara would have put him into a hibernation trance and you didn't want that. Raban shook his head. Let's leave him here to stare at her until he can move again. I want him to consider the error of his ways. Just like an awful fate, isn't it? Especially after, uh, I mean, this is what, page 355. And Gurney Halleck spent the entirety of the book so far trying to rescue her. And then he just watches her die. Another great uh, Zen Sunny wisdom from the wandering quote. Freedom is an elusive concept. Some men hold themselves prisoner even when they have the power to do as they please and go where they choose. While others are free in their hearts even as shackles restrain them. And actually that kind of ties back to Halleck there. He was free in his heart even though he couldn't move. A Fremen saying here, heaven must be the sound of running water. And I just particularly love that because... Even reading the original Dune books, one of the things that fascinated me the most is like Fremen culture and the way they think about water. So even like I was saying earlier, the way that they consider spitting on the ground to be a mark of respect because it's showing that you're willing to sacrifice some of your body's water. So this idea of heaven being the sound of running water I thought was very cool. And then Pardo Kynes, he's the planetologist uh, and he's written an Arrakis Primer and the quote from that is, There is no such thing as a law of nature. There is only a series of laws relating to man's practical experience with nature. These are laws of man's activities. They change as man's activities change. Which A is very true. And B, they actually change as our understanding of the world around us changes as well. So what was considered a law of nature a thousand years ago might have been that, you know, the four elements are earth, wind, water and fire. Um, and then now, you know, current laws of nature are quantum theory and all of this stuff. A quote here from Rebecca of Jinaz, uh, the capacity to learn is a gift, the ability to learn is a skill, the willingness to learn is a choice. And um, <laughs> another great uh, bit of Fremen culture here, this is a Fremen lament, you carve wounds upon my flesh and write there in salt. And I'm determined to remember that for next time somebody upsets me, I'm going to use that. From the Butlerian Jihad handbook for our grandchildren, the Butlerian Jihad being kind of the war against machines basically and so it says all technology is suspect and must be considered potentially dangerous which I would argue is true I mean even a pen and paper okay then we get this bit um, Liet uh, who is Pardo Kynes' son uh, is getting married to what's her name uh, buh, 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 Farula and um, him and his friend Warwick were both in love with her and they basically had this challenge where she challenged them to go and find her in the desert and the first one to find her would be her husband um, and then Warwick found her first and they got married and then Leah and Warwick were out in the desert and a big sandstorm came and basically Warwick kind of sacrificed himself for Leah because Leah was the son of the prophet but then Warwick didn't die um, basically some mad shit happened then he did die later on um, I don't want to spoil too much of the plot there for you. But yeah, uh, then Leah and uh, Farula are getting married. And um, Leah's mum comes to see him just before the wedding. And uh, she holds a flask to him and she says, I've brought you something, dearest, in preparation for your wedding. Leah emerged from his troubled thoughts. I've never seen that before. It is said that when a woman feels a special destiny for her child, when she senses great things will come from him, she instructs the midwives to distill and retain the amniotic fluid from the birth. A mother may give this to her son on his wedding day. She extended the flask. Keep it well, Leah. This is the last commingling of your essence and mine from the time we shared one body. Now you will commingle your life with another. Two hearts, when joined, may yield the strength of more than two. Imagine it's your wedding day and your mum comes up and is like, here, have my amniotic fluid. Thanks, mum. It's a different culture 
Fremen culture. And um, we get this where Duncan is thinking about how this, basically this war happened or a big battle happened. Um, and I just thought this actually reminded me of like World War One, and it's all tra traced back to the assassination of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. And actually that can then be traced further back to the reasons for the assassination, you know. Seeing something sparkle in a pile of rubble, Duncan stepped over debris to retrieve it. He pulled out a silver bracelet, wiped it on his sleeve. Tight clusters of charms hung from the band. Tiny swords, guild highliners, ornithopters. Rejoining the others, Duncan handed it to Denari. Let's hope it didn't belong to a child, the bulky man said. Duncan had already watched four dead children dragged from the debris, the sons and daughters of school employees. The final death toll would be in the thousands. Could it all be traced back to the single insult of expelling Grumman students, which had been a justifiable act in response to House Maritani's outrageous attack on innocent Ikazi civilians, which had been caused by the assassination of an ambassador at a banquet on Arrakis, which in turn had been provoked by suspected crop sabotage. He says, it seems senseless and when will it end? And uh, this is from the Tleksu Secret Handbook. No one person can ever know everything that is in the heart of another. We are all face dancers in our souls. And face dancers are basically sort of like doppelgangers. They can take on the appearance of other people. And I just like that idea that, that we're all face dancers in our souls. We all have our secrets that people can't tell. You, nobody knows whether you're telling the truth or not, you know? And then we have here uh, a Zen Sunny observation. We as humans tend to make pointless demands of our universe, asking meaningless questions. Too often we make such queries after developing an expertise within a frame of reference which has little or no relationship to the context in which the question is asked. And that reminded me of the idea that like, when you start to become a fam familiar with a subject, you think that you know more about it than you do, and then as you learn more and more, you realize how little you do know. So, um, it's kind of like how you can be fooled by thinking, you know, you can be fooled thinking that a little bit of knowledge is actually a lot of knowledge. And um, yeah, Leto's son gets killed. I don't think that's a huge spoiler. I'm not sure if it's mentioned in the original Dune books, um, but obviously the, he wasn't there. So that was, you, you knew something was gonna happen, you know? Um, and Jessica's trying to kind of calm him because he's been offered, they could bring him back as a goaler, but it's from his enemies and, She's basically like, don't do it. He'd have to sacrifice his friend, Romba, um, and it's just, it's not worth it. In fact, the Telexu, there's, uh, they hate Romba and his family because they're the people who've taken over the the world they used to run. And they're worried that they'll create a goal out of him and basically keep torturing him and cloning him and torturing him and, and cloning him indefinitely. Um, but Leto's still thinking about making this trade so that he can have his son brought back as a goaler. And Jessica says, Leto, I know you're only acting out of love, but sometimes love can guide a person in the wrong direction. Love can blind us to the truth. You're on the wrong path, my duke, and you know it in your heart. You must never love the dead more than the living. And I think that's fair. You, you never should. And finally, the one last thing I want to share here is a Bene Gesserit axiom. Love is an ancient force, one that served its purpose in its day, but is no longer essential for the survival of the species. That's a bit bleak in it anyway prelude to june house arcana by brian herbert and kevin j anderson um so this is the second in this like trilogy of uh, prequels and i thought what was really interesting is how well it acts as a standalone story like you can feel everything wrapping up from about this much towards the end of the book you're like oh it's all wrapping up now and all the threads are kind of coming together and it was amazing that it managed to do that despite being book two in a trilogy that's also a prequel series you know um still you wouldn't want to read it as a standalone like read the original dune books first at least the first four i would say you could probably get away after that herbert and kevin j anderson actually work really well together as a writing team so as i say this is the second of them that i've read now and i've enjoyed both of them this was actually possibly even stronger than house of trades i would give it a strong four out of five would recommend especially to june fans do check it out so there we have it that's what i made of house harkonnen by brian herbert and kevin j anderson as always don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video hit that subscribe button for more and i will see you soon for another bookish video thanks a lot Bye bye